James, it's a real pleasure to have you on the channel. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so I'd really love to explore a few of the topics that we've talked about quite a bit on the channel, and I know that you your work touches on as well. And one of the big topics and seems to resonate quite strongly is the idea of the meaning crisis, that we're mm -hmm. in a meaning crisis. And also my perspective is that one of the one of the factors in that is that culturally i worked in the media for many years and was sort of very well aware of the, the kind of i'd call it a stranglehold that the new atheist worldview in particular had on culture and and media and that seems to be shifting uh, quite noticeably that the they don't seem to be the force that they used to be in the culture what's your kind of overall take on the meaning crisis and where we're at sort of culturally right now yeah, by the way, I, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting to see the sort of fading star of new atheism in that regard. Uh, uh, and in a sense, though, why uh, someone like Richard Dawkins seems as loud as ever. But I think it's actually a sign of a certain frustration on his part that he doesn't, he can't believe that he's not getting the cultural uptake that he would have expected. And um, and yet, I think he's not getting the cultural uptake that he expected because um, he doesn't. He offers such a flattened view of what it is to be human. You know, there's just no. Um, the, it, all it offers is the kind of self congratulation of enlightenment. And then what? Do you know what I mean? Like, it, there's, there's just not a, a, a way of life, a vision for the fullness of being human. So I think in some sense, it just doesn't speak to really deep human hungers uh, that we can't sort of efface. And we might try to write over them, but they are still there. So I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this notion of the meaning crisis. I think that's a lot of um, what I'm trying to speak into uh, with my latest book, On the Road with St. Augustine, because I, I think that he's, we're, we're in a moment of what I call cracks in the secular, where um, a narrative that we've been sort of telling ourselves, in some ways for a couple of hundred years, in other ways for a couple of generations, a story that we've been trying to tell ourselves, um, A, hasn't worked, uh, has generated rampant loneliness, social isolation, depression, anxiety. Um, and, and yet we also feel like it should be otherwise. It, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And so I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a really exciting moment to be at the sort of waning end of a very flat secularizing tale, uh, even though I don't have any illusions of there being some like glorious other hegemonic narrative that emerges from the process. I think it's some, um, I love it that, that people seem to be having conversations that we couldn't have imagined 20 years ago in some ways. Is that, is that your experience as well? Like you're seeing um, openness and hunger that maybe was sort of suppressed almost before. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It, it does feel like, a certain kind of narrative is visibly failing more and more readily. And I just want to go back to what you said before. What, what, what is your sense of what, what is that narrative that you think is, uh, I can't remember your exact words, but you said something similar that, that there is a sense that there is a narrative that hasn't worked. How, what, how do you summarize that particular narrative? Yeah. And maybe, and maybe it's not just one thing. I, I don't want to oversimplify. Um, but I, I think there's a couple facets of a dominant story that people have been told they ought to live into. Uh, one aspect of it is, I think, the sort of enlightenment piece of it, right? That is, um, uh, the most important thing is to be the smartest person in the room. And that means um, allying yourself with a very sort of narrow vision of what counts as rationality. So I, I think one, one thread or stream of that story has been a really reductionistic account of what it means to be rational. Mm -hmm. and, and to be rational then would require almost undoing all kinds of aspects that we kind of in our gut know are part of being human. Uh, so I think that's part of it. I, I would probably also say um, 
and I'll be really intrigued to hear your your thoughts on this. I, I think um, a story of autonomy and independence that has made it my uh, sole responsibility to make up a story for myself. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Like, in other words, mm -hmm. I, I think we've inherited, and, and I grant, I'm, I'm speaking from an American context, and I know that there will be some differences with the UK, but I, I do think in, in the West generally, we've ended up with this narrative that says, you can be whatever you want, uh, there is no normative good. There's no specified good that you need to live towards, which sounds liberating. I, th I get why that sounds liberating. It's like, oh, okay, so nobody's going to tell me what to do until you are left with the, the sheer burden and responsibility of making up mm. something. And uh, I think that can be its own prison. I think that can end up being its own chain where now... Um, the, the burden is on me to be so innovative and so unique and special and come up with this story, but it's also exhausting. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, and, and we, at the same time, we are being sold a, 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 a version of how to buy that way of life. So there's a, there's a weird way in which I think consumer capitalism kind of plays into this myth of autonomy and independence and that we have to make up our own story. What I see in young people, I'm, I'm a university professor, so I you know, work with 20 year olds all the time. But what I see is just an increased exhaustion with, um, it's, I say burden, it's, it's not because they want to be irresponsible, it's just because there's something that, that's uh, um, enslaving about such a, a, a narrative mm -hmm. and they're actually i find people more and more hungry to say okay i don't want you to take away my freedom i don't want you to take away my agency my burden but could you give me some hints <laughs> about what a good life might look like and maybe there are other people around um that could help me live alongside rather than just as this autonomous independent individual. I, I think that's the other, the other side of the autonomy narrative is not just the uh, burden of having to make it up, so to speak. It's also just the utter atomization and isolation that comes from, oh, well, I'm, I'm in charge of myself, but that also means I'm not with people mm -hmm. and other people almost are, are portrayed as this kind of, you know, um, thefts, thieves of my autonomy and independence. And I, I think it's a, it's a terrible way to try to be human, it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah, there were a few things that came up while you were, while you were talking that remind me of, so one of the, the, the first, the origin of, of Rebel Wisdom was very much looking at Jordan Peterson's thought. And he, there were a few things that you said that really sort of map on to a, a couple of things, one of which is, the idea he talks about Nietzsche and Jung and the, mm. that Nietzsche effectively said, OK, so God is dead. We've got rid of these kind of narratives which gave us meaning and gave us a direction and we will have to create our own. And this is something I think that you're saying. It's like, yeah, there's we've got rid of all of the all of the traditional ways of being. So we we're now fated to be autonomous and to create our own meaning. And then P Peterson's reading of Jung is that Jung then came along and said, not so fast, we can't, we are not those kind of creatures, we cannot create our own meanings. And we are embedded in mythologies, we are embedded in archetypes, we are embedded in deeper stories, whether we like it or not. And they're actually part of our, if you want to go as deep as you can go, we're, they're actually part of our physiology. They're mm. actually part of mm. our, we're mm. impersonating stories and we're impersonating things that we don't even fully understand. I saw a, your, I saw your lecture, um, you are, we are what we love, yeah, you are what you love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, where you seem to be saying very much the same thing that a lot of the things that we are acting out in our lives, we're not fully aware of. We're, we're they're far beyond the realm of sort of conscious thought, but we are acting out patterns and stories and beliefs and ideas that are very, very deep. Is that does that scan for you? The, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in fact, I was also thinking of you mentioned that you were just in Toronto and um, one of my favorite novelists is a Canadian novelist named Robertson Davies, who is actually a huge young de uh, um, devotee. And, and 
it just strikes me, uh, and you see it in the novels of Robertson Davies, to be human is to be a storied creature. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just, when, um, if we are beset by identity politics today, I, I think, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to be frustrated by that, but I think it's still an outworking of the fact that people need to know who they belong to mm. and what story they fit into in order to have sort of motivation and meaning. And so even if I might be frustrated with the way it manifests, I still see behind it a deep hunger and desire and a manifestation of the fact that to be human is to be storied. We are narrative that's animals. That's probably the best definition or the best uh, defense of identity politics I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like I want to I want to meet even the, the things that frustrate me. I want to meet sympathetically. And I, I do think like you just said, and as as Jung is, is pointing out, um, what if it is the case that human beings are made in such a way, are wired in such a way, are, are scripted in such a way that, in fact, we can't realize the fullness of being human without honoring some feature of ourselves? I think part of that is is noting that we are narrative animals. And I think um, it's also why mass consumer culture can exploit us as well, though. Do you know what I mean? Because in some ways, I think, um, I think marketing understands that we are narrative creatures better than the university, better than the church, to be honest. Uh, um, and... And in that sense, they actually play on our deep hunger for story and narrative and to live into something, to become a character in a drama. But then they, they utilize that for the sake of selling us crap. And, and um, so that's, that's such a cynical deployment of who we are. Whereas I think what you're saying, what you're suggesting is, um, maybe one of the reasons why the experiment of this utterly nihilistic Nietzschean project doesn't work is because you just can't overwrite the palimpsest of the human heart, which is sort of longing for some sort of fullness, something more. And um, yeah, I, I think I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I mean, I still think we live in a mixed reality where there's a lot of people who are still imagining that's a possible way of doing it but I, I guess I'm I'm more intrigued by the symptoms of exhaustion and um, scrambling for people to say there's got to be a better way to do this in a sense so yeah to, to say that we are uh, it, it to say we are what we love is to also recognize that our loves are susceptible to narrative formation, which means that they're also susceptible to narrative deformation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think becoming aware of that gives us, again, gives us back some agency mm -hmm. uh, so that I can see, oh, uh, it's almost like my eyes open and now I see, I, I see what a mass consumer culture is trying to do to me. Mm -hmm. um, what would it look like for me to become intentional? And I think this is a lot about what your whole project is about. What does it look like for me to become just much more aware and intentional about how to pursue a good life? I, I think um, mm. this whole, the very fact that we're having this conversation is such an encouraging mm. sign of our cultural moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different points to pick up here. Um, the one, the one thing I think would unite just about everyone that we've had on the channel um, is that they're all engaging with these deeper questions and there's some realization that we've gone, we've gone wrong in terms of, you could call it the materialist paradigm, you could call it the secular paradigm, you could call it, um, and you look at the symptoms everywhere from kind of the opiate crisis to the various sort of types of what I'd call kind of soul sickness that we're seeing mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the West. Um, but the, 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 key, the key question is, I think there's a there's a real there's a common realization that we need something in the place where religion used to be. Uh, but but the open question is like someone yeah. like Jonathan Pajot would say yes, and it's Christian. Yeah, it's it's religion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, sure, but, sure. So my, my 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 I guess playing sort of slightly devil's yeah. advocate for one yeah. the word. My question would be, and I'm guessing that you would agree with Jonathan Pajot. It's like no, we have good religious traditions. We just need to renew them. 
is it realistic that Christianity could be renewed or could be could come back in a meaningful way? Or that's the question, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, and and this is no, this is exactly the conversation we should have. So um, now I'm also a philosopher. So when you ask me a question, what is realistic? I'm immediately wondering what the conditions of realism are. Right. So uh, if you ask, is it realistic? I'll just tell you from where I sit, let's remember, I believe in a God who raises the dead. So anything is possible. Um, but I, I do think this is the question. Is, and, I, and by the way, I don't think you, I can prove anything in this regard. So let, let's just think about how one could even have the conversation or discern on this matter. It seems to me, I agree that I think we see people who are realizing, okay, no, I need something more. There has to be something else. There has to be a better vision for how to be human. Um, I need meaning. Uh, I think when people entertain the implausibility of religion, first of all, I understand it. 80% 80, 80 of it, I totally get. 80% of religion is worth leaving, right? Um, to me, one way to think about, say, the, the difference between Christianity and, you know, Russell Brand or something, who, who I, I love in so many ways, you know, uh, um, I, I think we agree about a lot more than we disagree, um, is what vision for a way of life will, uh, offers a gift and doesn't just ask more of you. Do you know what I mean? In other words, I, I think so many of the alternatives to, I'll, I'll say Christianity, which is my confession. I think so many of the alternatives to Christianity are, they have a religious dynamic about them, but they are also kind of threatened to eat me alive because they still are putting, are expecting me to perform. Can you give an example of what you mean here? What kind of, are you talking about yeah. ideologies or? Uh, so about what? Ideologies or? Yeah, I, I, ideologies will be, be one example. Think of even like, let's just say, um, and, and I, I, I don't want to offend anybody with this, it's just an example that comes to mind. Let's, let's take wokeness as kind of, I, I do think that's, that somebody say, okay, there's gotta be more I'm going to devote myself to the cause of justice, which of course we should all be devoted to. But then what happens is it turns into this performative dynamic where um, really it's still an act of self invention on my part. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a confidence in human willpower. And I guess one of the reasons why I follow someone like St. Augustine is because I have a very, what I think, realistic set of expectations about human willpower and what I can accomplish and what we can accomplish. And instead, it seems to me the alternative that Christianity holds out isn't just meaning. It is, it is meaning, but the alternative that Christianity holds out is scandalous because it's called grace. It's, it's this gift it's, it's a devotion to a God who gives himself away. And I, I think, um, I do think sacrifice is at the heart of what we're talking about here in some ways. And I, I think one of the, I guess one of the distinguishing characteristics of Christianity is that it is not just a God who calls us to sacrifice, but it is a God who sacrificed himself uh, and then from that flows a gift of a grace that is a gift. Now, I, I say that's scandalous because I do think probably the last bastion of our autonomy is always the pride that imagines we can do this on our own. Mm. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, I just find myself it really- Sounds a lot re like uh, kind of Alcoholics Anonymous or the 12 step programs. So I was just going to say, in fact, I, um, as I've been working on St. Augustine, this, this new book, On the Road with St. Augustine, the thread that I kept, kept coming back to are recovery communities. And, and what's so intriguing in recovery communities is you have to come to an end of yourself. There's actually a really remarkable book you might enjoy by a writer named Leslie Jameson called The Recovering. 
mm. which is sort of her insider account of both addiction and recovery. But she also looks at different writers, literary writers who've grappled with that. And at one point she says, you know, one of the terrible things about addiction is it narrows your repertoire to this very restricted set of desire, use, repeat, desire, use, repeat. And what the addict really needs liberation from is what she calls the claustrophobic crawl space of the self. Mm. And I, I guess what I, what wor not worries me, but I guess what contrasts so many other modes of meaning making from the religious is they still feel like they are dependent on that claustrophobic crawl space of the self. There's still, the, at least there's still a lot of options that are saying I can do this or we can do this. Whereas I think what Christianity talks about is this drama in which a God gives himself to bring us to the end of ourselves, which is then finding the new grace of dependence. That's, that's scandalous to the autonomous mind, right? The, the, that dependence could be a beautiful liberation. But I do think, um, I guess I do wonder if that is what is exactly distinctive and sustaining. Because it also translates into um, a deeply communal vision. Right. Like, th now, again, there are all kinds of forms of Christianity, which are this sort of privatized me and Jesus autonomous BS. I have zero interest in those. Do you know what I mean? th and this is 90 percent of American Christianity, let's be honest. Um, but but I think at the heart of this kind of Christian vision, this this Catholic vision, if you will, that you see in someone like St. Augustine is this deeply communal picture. Augustine at one point says, I could not be happy without friends. There's this, this, um, there's this sense in which the self is porous um, and that's an opening for others to come in and actually, well, they can steal from me or they can fuel me. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I think that, that I'm encouraged by in things like rebel wisdom and, and other sorts of conversations happening is they are deep communities. Do you know, like these are, uh, um, I, I think it's really clear that people find a belonging there. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just say that what is built into the drama of the Christian narrative is an account of why we need to belong, but it's a belonging that also isn't just about what am I getting out of this? It's what am I being called to? And I, I think um, it's a hell of a story. You mentioned kind of woke as, as a particular kind of narrative or ideology or perspective. And that reminded me, I mean, it's not an original insight. A few people have made this, this point. Um, I think I've heard Sam Harris make it before, uh, maybe Douglas Murray, that there is, for example, in kind of woke culture, what they call cancel culture nowadays, We've got sin and we've got, we've got this sort of sense of almost like a semi-religious narrative, but we don't have redemption. So this yeah. idea that you make a tweet sort of 10 years ago, you maybe apologize for it, but you're still, you're still a sinner. And there's no, like the danger, I think, that well, a lot of people are feeling with these modern ideologies is that they seem to be parasitical on religion, but they don't have the kind of, they, there's no place for redemption, for example. Yes, yes, yes. There's no, and I, one of the things that has struck me is there is no time for repentance, right? So uh, um, there's, there's no room for forgiveness because you are just supposed to have mastered the requisite orthodoxy. And if you haven't mastered the requisite orthodoxy, then you're canceled. Um, but it also, and this is true, I think, especially in kind of social media spaces, there is an absolute um, intolerance for giving people the space and time to change their minds mm -hmm. and to grow. It's like, no, you, are, you either reflect what, what we all think now or you don't. And that's, um, you're right. I do think it's parasitic on religion. It's a little bit like having sin without absolution. And it's a bit like having um, confession, but actually no space for repentance. Um, uh, now, I, I think that also stems from the fact, again, uh, there's still something so self-generated about all of this 
so that it comes from a space of a kind of self-righteousness and therefore doesn't really have room for grace. Grace, grace is just the Christian word for everything is gift. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I, I'm a, I'm a receiver. Um, I'm indebted and, um, it's not an accomplishment on my part. And I think what worries me, and, and we shouldn't pick, you know, cause when I, when I say woke culture, that might sound like I'm picking on the left. Heaven knows that the right has its own forms of this. And, and in, our, in our context in the States, I mean, there's another version of just being American that is as intolerant uh, of, uh, um, and giving room people people room in that regard. So no, I think it's I think what worries me most about that is the confidence in one's own enlightenment, self sufficiency, and purity. I, I this is another reason actually that Saint Augustine interests me is because we live woke culture, cancel culture is also a purity culture. Um, it re- exhibits remarkable self confidence uh, in our having mastered what we ought to be. Whereas Augustine, who's a Christian, bears witness to, he has no illusions of purity. Do you know what I mean? That's, there's, there's no illusions of um, my achieving purity. There's instead just a deep appreciation for the messiness of my own motives. Mm. And um, I find that more liberating than the burden of being pure, which I think is, just doomed to cynical hypocrisy at some point. You've mentioned St. Augustine a, a few times. I'm not hugely familiar with him as a sure. figure. Yeah. So you're very interested in a sort of St. Augustine for dummies. Why do you think he's so significant? And, and what, what, what are the key things to know about him as a historical figure? Yeah, so um, the, the baseline biography. So St. Augustine uh, lives in the late 300s and early 400s in North Africa. Um, is raised in a a sort of mix of a pagan, Roman, and African Christian home. His mother is St. Monica, which is a name that some people will will recognize, Santa Monica. Um, uh, He's most famous for a work called The Confessions, which some people refer to as like the first memoir uh, in the West. Um, I actually think that's complicated, but uh, what what he tell what the drama that he unfolds in his confessions is basically a drama of looking for love in all the wrong places. I mean, in some in some ways, the first half of Augustine's confessions is the is the narrative of a soul looking for meaning. Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's on this quest, and he and he tries to find one of the things that intrigues me about Augustine is he's so perennial and in some ways so contemporary because where does he look for meaning? He looks for meaning in education, sex, power, enlightenment, uh, political influence, uh, you know, uh, fame. I mean, he's in some ways all the places that we still look for sort of substitutes for meaning. Augustine tried all of those. Now, there are a lot of um, caricatures of Augustine out there, you know, the inventor of original sin, hated sex, all these kind of things. And there's, there's, I mean, there's parts of Augustine we would want to deconstruct. What I find fascinating about him is, A, he's a figure that basically tried all the things that we keep trying. <laughs> he, he, he sort of lived out this sort of playboy pursuit and then came to the end of it and realized there's got to be more to it than that. But he was also an incredible psychologist of the human heart. And, and um, his confessions is like this deep introspective dive into, um, well, his hungers. Like, what, what am I looking for? How am I trying to be human? And um, interestingly, I think one of his most enduring gifts just to the Western intellectual tradition as a whole is a reflection on the nature of freedom. So, so related very much to conversations we were having before about autonomy and independence, Augustine thinks freedom isn't just freedom of choice. It's not just multiplying your options. Free, true freedom is empowerment for the good. It's actually a gifted agency so that I can chase and become what I'm made to be. And um, 
I, I think his analysis feels very contemporary when I read it in that regard. What mm -hmm. I was reminded of there is that there's quite a similarity in many, um, in as a, as a sort of pattern of behavior and also in some religious tales of the man who has everything realizing it's not sufficient and then then has it having some kind of religious conversion i'm thinking of but like, the story of the buddha is very similar in that the buddha had everything and then yeah. um, one of my favorite poets john dunn mm. you know, if you're familiar with oh yeah absolutely he, he was a very similar it was a very similar story he was a playboy he was a um kind of a, a successful aristocrat and then towards the end of his life became deeply religious and then um, became Archbishop of Canterbury, I think, towards the end of his life. So it's quite mm, a, similar, mm, mm -hmm. a similar trajectory to a lot of lives, it seems. And, and it, it, um, it undercuts one of the dismissive narratives of religion as crutch or substitute or something, only insofar as um, this is not people trying to achieve something by means of their religion because they actually had achieved everything that one had hoped for. It was actually seeing through that uh, and realizing that that was almost a screen to what was really ultimate and what was really significant. You know, the other thing that I think is important, uh, I, I say in Augustine, but I would also just say in sort of historic Christianity is, this isn't even just about achieving an, a perspective. It's not even just believing in something different. It's about actually being able to give myself over to rituals, rhythms, practices, liturgies, in which I, um, in a way, I give myself over to the narrative, even on the days I don't believe it. Even, even on the days I'm not sure about it. Even on the days I maybe don't uh, I'm suspicious of it, but there's something, um, this is why, I, again, I think it's very communal. There's, there is, um, what Augustine points to is Christianity as a practiced way of being together. Mm. And that, that, that dynamic of ritual, I think also speaks to human hungers, right? That it's not just, yes, it's not just that I need a better story to believe about myself. Mm. I need, um, tangible, visceral, tactile, kinesthetic rhythms and rituals mm. so that that story sinks into my bones and it's not just something that I'm processing intellectually. And, and this again, to the parallel, it's a lot like AA, it's a lot like recovery in which the point of going to meeting is not to get information. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not going, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the meeting with my notebook and tell me the things. You, you don't do you, do you know the, the writer David Foster Wallace? Yes. So uh, um, in, in his novel, Infinite Jests, uh, actually a recovery house is a really, really important scene. And uh, there's, a, there's a point where a character realizes, somebody tells this addict in that recovery house who thinks he's going to think his way out of his problems. Mm. The, the counselor says to him, your best thinking got you here. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like you, you, all your thinking got you to was your enslavement to your addiction. You, you actually aren't going to think your way out of this problem. You are going to practice your way to different thinking. And I, I don't know, even as somebody who's, uh, who literally makes his life as an intellectual, um, uh, as a philosopher, I, I think it's really, really important that for me, the Christian life is actually a script of how to live together in practice in community. And that reminds me of something about something more fundamental than my thinking, which is my loving. Yeah, I, I'd love to, for a lot of people kind of who are, are not Christians or not sort of deeply involved in these kind of conversations, the whole uh, sort of Christian denominations and the different kind of movements around Christianity is very confusing. Sure. Could you tell me what your particular uh, denomination is and what oh. does it differ from the from the others? And for extra marks, maybe you can tell me why your one is right and they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, I, well, I, I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, um, and I, I don't want to be pedantic either, because I, I, so I'm not sure where your listeners are. Uh, um, of course, the, the, the two great 
sort of streams in Christianity are most fundamentally divided between East and West. Mm. And Jonathan Paggio, who we said before represents uh, Eastern, I'm in the Western Christian tradition. And then within that Western, uh, and of which Augustine is kind of the founding father, if you will, of Western Christianity, which becomes Roman Catholicism. And then in the 1500s, you get the Protestant Reformation, which is, I, but here's what's important. I don't think that that should be understood as either a revolution or a fundamental rejection of that Western quote unquote Catholic tradition. It's a reform movement within it. In fact, what's interesting, uh, uh, this might be more than you care about, but the, the Protestant reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, they were all readers of St. Augustine. And in a way, what they were doing is they were going back to the founding father to renew the Western tradition. So my Christian tradition grows out of that Augustinian renewal movement that we call the Protestant Reformation. So I'm part of what's called the Dutch Reformed uh, stream, which, is, which will sound odd because my name is Smith and I live in the United States. But uh, there's one of the fascinating things about Christianity is what how significant immigration patterns are and migration patterns are to where Christian streams go. So I'm, I'm kind of an unapologetic Protestant, but I'm a Protestant of a Catholic flavor. That is, I see myself in continuity with and very much indebted to this deep heritage of the tradition. And one of the most important things that I think has happened in Protestantism over the past, even just 40 or 50 years, is we've all realized um, there were versions of the Protestant Reformation and then the Enlightenment that cut us off from pre-modern wisdom and sources mm -hmm. because we bought into a narrative of chronological snobbery in which we thought the newer was always better. And I think we've seen through that. So there's been, there's been I think, Christianity's own reckoning with meaning and, and late modernity. And I think for those of us in Protestant Christian traditions, that has meant realizing, oh, we threw overboard a lot of gifts of ancient wisdom. So one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book on St. Augustine was to go back and say, man, we can go back to this ancient African and find, it's like he's reading our mail today. So um, uh, the, the reason why uh, I'm in the Protestant tradition uh, is because I also think that there's room for reform and renewal within Christianity. Uh, I'll also say my stream, I'm not going to make the argument for why my, why my stream is best. I, I don't, not even sure I believe that. <laughs> I, you know, I would just have deep sympathy with sort of Anglican, Episcopalian uh, 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 renditions of Christianity as well. I will say one thing that's important to my tradition is how and why Christianity was actually liberating for women's voices and witness. So, so one reason why I could never become a Roman Catholic is because uh, for me, what one of the renewals that happened was um, a recognition of women's gifts so that they can serve fully. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's a really, really important manifestation of a Christian impetus. You, your listeners might not know that the first people that the resurrected Jesus appeared to, to bear witness to him, were women. And that was a revolutionary uh, uh, um, uh, uh, endeavor, so to speak. And so I, I, I'm trying to live into that a little bit. Yeah. Right. And... Yeah, I wanted to ask you very quickly, I want to move on to practice because you mentioned practice and I mm, think it's a really, mm. really important part of this conversation becoming more and more important. It's something that I think everyone who has been sort of following this, this, this sort of growing conversation is now getting more and more into, okay, what are the practices? What does it mean yeah. to put these out into our lives? But just before we go on to that, I'd, I'd like to ask you about Jordan Peterson. Okay. No, um, I've talked to Paul Vanderclair a couple of times about this, and he said that he's had a lot of people coming to his church who've been pretty much interested in Christianity because of watching Jordan Peterson's lectures. Mm. And mm. he's been the most high profile ambassador for, for at least taking these religious stories seriously. Have you 
look much at his work and what, what have you made of it? Some. Um, one, one of the things that complicates it a little bit is, so I'm a philosopher by training and my training is actually in what we call continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that complicates it is uh, Peterson has a tendency to make claims about figures that I know well professionally and I don't buy his take on it. Do you know what I mean? So like I, I find myself uh, uh, just slightly rolling my eyes at the way he trots out Jacques Derrida or cultural Marxism and things like that. So that's partly a professional uh, um, frustration, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but I, I totally, and, and there's a little bit of a way in which um, within Canada, maybe in particular, he got hooked up with a certain kind of public agenda that I just, it didn't excite me that much. All that said, I do, I, I totally understand and, and see how he's clearly speaking to a deep hunger um, for this meaning making, as, as you said. And so I'm, I'm, I, I, I see us trying to sort of bear witness to the fullness of being human in the wake of secularism's failure. And, and so in that sense, you know, I, I'm sympathetic. I, I'm just a little bit concerned, if, if I can be sort of honest about this. I, I, the one thing that makes me sort of cautious is how gendered the response to Jordan Peterson seems to be. And I, I, don't, I don't claim to be an, ex, an expert at all, but uh, um, I, I'm somebody who wants to make sure that the fullness of being human is something that's not just painted for young white men. And um, uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why I think an ancient African is so interesting. But it's, it's also one of the reasons why um, uh, there's a chapter in my book on mothers because St. Monica plays such a huge role. And it's just, I, I just want to make sure that uh, the other half of humanity is, in, is included in this. But, uh, but I'm really intrigued. Uh, and, and we share an overlapping concern, I think, with uh, Toronto, Carl Jung, and then how it gave rise to the novels of Roberts and Davies. In fact, Dave, Roberts and Davies, who I mentioned earlier, was the first master of Massey College at the University of Toronto. And so to me, when I first started hearing Peterson, uh, it actually brought back to mind uh, a series of novels that Davies had written in the 70s, which I just think it's kind of cool to imagine. As a Canadian, I think it's cool that there's this burbling and bubbling of ideas coming out of Toronto that now the world is paying attention to, too. Yeah, and like I said before, I definitely recommend John Vivekey as-, as Yes, well. yeah, yeah, no, that's, I'm yeah, glad to learn of that. And just, as you mentioned, Foucault and Derrida, what do you think that Peterson doesn't understand about them? What, what, oh, what? That, that would be a much longer conversation, but I just think that, I think he paints them as, to, to, to paint someone, for example, as Jacques Derrida, as just this sort of Nietzschean nihilist, is not to have read his corpus. So I, uh, I have another book called Who's Afraid of Postmodernism, which is uh, Derrida, Foucault, and Lyotard. And uh, interestingly, it was written before the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. I think it's a 2006 book. But I, was, I have been thinking about a bit as Peterson's take on these figures uh, has, has gotten off the ground, only because I think you see a Derrida actually um, a desire for an openness to transcendence, for example. Like there's, there's a real, it's, it's, I don't want to deny that it's ambiguous, but there is a sense in which Augustine, or, or sorry, Derrida by the, in the last 10 years of his career is talking about the messianic, right? Is talking about a justice that is to come. So there's, it's just a much more complicated story. I, as an academic who also translates ideas for wider audiences, I know that every scholar who does that is in danger of dying the death of a thousand missing footnotes. So, but I, it would be, it, someday it would be, it would be fun to have that conversation because I think there's, there's work to be done on that front. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm not, a, I'm not so aware of, of Derrida, but I know that uh, Leotard, for example, talked about the transcendent and that yes. without the transcendent, the postmodernist idea falls apart or the whole postmodernist project falls apart without yes. the idea of the transcendent. Yes. Which, which is 
which to me means there's an awareness of the sort of hall of mirrors we can get lost in if we don't have that sort of um, that sort of fixed point. So yes. I, I said, the, the Derrida, yeah, it, it, it would be an interesting thing maybe to return to. Uh, yeah. To yeah. 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 Uh, it, it, one one uh, interesting footnote too is that one of the first posthumous works of Leotard that was published after his death was a book on Saint Augustine. No. Nah. So so Saint Augustine has been this enduring fascinating Derrida, Foucault, Leotard, um, Jean Luc Marion, all these contemporary and twentieth century French figures, Camus, uh, they all engaged with Saint Augustine at various points in the twentieth century, and that's kind of one of the subtexts of of my book on the road to Saint Augustine is that you could see some in someone like Camus, Albert Camus, um, also a hunger for meaning making. Mm. And, and also appreciated just what it meant to not accept Christianity. Mm. Um, and yet he, and, and I actually think he's the most Augustinian atheist. He, he sort of, he's, it's so deep. He did his doctoral dissertation on Augustine and Neoplatonism. It's fascinating. So that's one of the threads I chase in the book. Awesome. Great. And just coming back to the idea of practice, because that, mm. that definitely seems to be, something that's really alive right now. What are the practices that we need to uh, engage in, rediscover, live out in our lives? What's your, what's your attitude to, to practice? Yeah, so I think um, we are what we love and we love what we practice. <laughs> so, so in that sense, um, uh, for me, practices are habit-forming, heart-shaping, um, rhythms, rituals, and routines that actually gift me with an identity. So it's, it's really, really important to then ask, what am I practicing? And, what am I, and when I'm asking that, what I should really be asking myself is, what story is embedded and, and enacted by these rhythms and rituals? What ultimate story about who I am, what we call to be? Um, so I use the word, it's a churchy word, but I actually use the word liturgy, liturgies, to just talk about love shaping practices. Now that means there are all kinds of liturgies that are outside of religious contexts, right? Now, what is a liturgy? A liturgy is a performed, enacted narrative. It's a script that when I give myself over to it, in a way that story is getting inscribed in my bones. It's getting under my skin. It's, it's getting buried in my gut. And then I start living out that story. So I don't, I don't think my way to new loves. I practice my way to new loves. Now, um, I do think that our late modern culture offers all kinds of deformative liturgies in that regard. Like we talked about marketing earlier. So I think consumer culture is its own liturgy. But it's mostly one that defaces me and deforms me and, and tells me a story about myself that is, makes me less than human. Mm. Um, and for me, again, just uh, I'm not trying to prove anything, or, or, uh, but I would say the way I understand Christianity is not just a belief system. It's not just a worldview. It is this enacted script of grace and so at the heart of, of Christianity for me is the practice of the liturgy in which uh, the story of God and Christ reconciling all things to himself is enacted. And it's important that in that, like, for example, you know, we never go to church without engaging in confession, but we also never engage in confession without hearing the good news of mercy and pardon and forgiveness. That's pretty good practice for how to relate to other people. Yeah. Um, but it's so that but it's deeply communal as well so it's it's um it's what in the christian tradition we call these are sacraments which means that they are means of grace that there's a kind of fueling of capacity and possibility in me just by giving myself over to them and i know that sounds kind of crazy but it's part of the mystery of it all i, I think it's really important that it's communal do you know what I mean? Like, this isn't something I can, you know, no podcast will ever substitute for the Eucharist. Uh, no matter how smart it might make me, there, there's a kind of enactment of a story that physically, I, I really think it's important. Christianity is a deeply incarnational religion, right? Like it believes, not only does it believe that God became human, 
it believes that humans are ensouled bodies and that embodiment is really, really crucial. So the practices are a way for bodies to get the story. Mm. And then the last thing I'll just say too is the, the I, I guess I've become more and more convinced that practices of friendship are so crucial in this cultural moment in which we find ourselves. I, I think, I, I think we almost don't know how to be friends anymore. We know how to be companions. We know how to be a gang. We know how to hang out, but I'm not sure that we really know how to be friends. And, and my sincere hope is that, that ch churches are not big performance halls. At the end of the day, they are congregations where people learn how to be friends of God and friends with God's friends. And I, I, I hope that's its own grace in it. And just to pick up on something you just said about we are what we love, do you think mm -hmm. we can choose what we love? So I think it's complicated. So <laughs> I think on the one hand, I could say, you know, I talked to, to David and I become convinced, oh man, I've got to live for something different. So, you know, tomorrow morning I'm like, no, now I'm going to live, love this. The problem is I don't think you can think your way to new loves. What I can choose to do is to become intentional about giving myself over to a different community of practice, which is then going to transform my heart habits so that I am learning to love something and someone else. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean? Um, there's, uh, it's a bit like Mary, I, I've been married for 29 years. And, and on the one hand, obviously I chose to marry my wife. She chose to marry me miraculously. And, and every day you kind of make a choice. But actually what, what keeps it a covenantal relationship is doing things. You know, it's just like these, these check-in of, you know, you never leave the house without kissing each other goodbye. You know, you, you never go to bed angry. You know, there's, there's just the rhythms of a life together. And that's actually what forges it much more than what we are thinking or believing or choosing. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.